Hello, Internet, and welcome to another episode of That's All I Have to Say About That. As always, I'm your host, Stephen Mackey. Today we're talking about the FBI, because apparently some Trump supporters recently aren't the biggest fans of the FBI. In the same way that I hated the referee after the fifth foul he called against the Seahawks at a recent game. I mean, that guy clearly didn't want us to win. So why talk about it today? Well, Devin Nunez just released a memo that is apparently damning to the Trump investigation. And in case you're wondering, yes, it's the same guy who had to step aside from the investigation between Trump and Russia. Republican uh, chairman there, Devin Nunes, temporarily stepping aside from the investigation amid accusations that he actually violated ethics rules. Yeah, but he's probably changed. Wait, my Republican viewers, don't shoot your TVs just yet. Because while that's generally where the reporting stops, if you look into what he was being investigated for, it was... The bipartisan House Ethics Committee announced it would investigate whether he illegally revealed classified information in this bombshell press conference last month. The intelligence community incidentally collected information about U.S. citizens involved in the Trump transition. Okay, so we had to step down for revealing classified information regarding intelligence agencies collecting information on U.S. citizens involved in the Trump transition. Why does that sound familiar? House conservatives are demanding the release of a memo. It's a memo by the House Intelligence Committee Chairman Devin Nunes. A memo that details allegations of FBI missteps during the 2016 election. It seems Devin Nunes learned a valuable trick. If you make the people demand it, it's no longer unethical to release it. So now, it's time to talk about the memo itself. Now, I'm not here to tell you what to think, I'm just here to highlight the major points of this four-page memo. That's right, it's shorter than the little golden books. And if you read it to your kid, it'll put them right to sleep. Although, it might keep you up all night. Now, I read a full-length copy of this memo, with a link to it in the description if you want to comb through it yourself. So this memo is broken up into five sections. First we have the Steele Dossier. You know the document written by the British spy who probably didn't imagine his legacy would be two Russian prostitutes being on a bed Obama had previously slept in. Oh man, talk about his step down from 007. So anyways, what did he have to say about this memo? Well, first it says that the Steele dossier's author was paid over $160,000 by the DNC and Clinton campaign via the law firm Perkins Cole and the research firm Fusion GPS to obtain derogatory information on Donald Trump's ties to Russia, which was breaking news a year ago. This opposition research was a key part of the approved Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that allowed the FBI to tap Carter Page's phones. Although, interestingly enough, this in itself is not the scandal, because it was deemed credible information. The real problem here is that neither the initial application in October of 2016, nor any of the renewals, disclose or reference the role of the DNC, Clinton campaign, or any part or campaign in funding Steele's efforts. Oh man, if only the FBI had listened to my high school teacher. Turns out that it was important to learn how to make a bibliography. That said, they did cite the Steele dossier, they just didn't dictate the people who funded it. Next we focus on the FISA application itself, which also cited a Yahoo News article. First off, really? The top brass at the FBI is citing Yahoo News? That should be setting off all sorts of red flags on its own, not even Google News. I guess you could post top secret things in Yahoo News because no one's going to read it. Imagine if they made the The Post style movie about this. Coming this summer, freedom has a new call. Yahoo! So anyways, they cited a Yahoo News article in their application, which said it corroborated the Steele dossier, while in actuality, it was pulling leaked information from a yet-to-be-published Steele dossier. Wow, again, the power of MLA formatting. Now jumping around because this forum is about as well organized an, as an unteleprompter Donald Trump speech, on October 30th, Steele was terminated as an FBI source after he disclosed his relationship to the FBI to the media. But he should have been fired before the first Carter Page FISA application was submitted when he disclosed his relationship to Yahoo News. Now this wouldn't have prevented the dossier from being in the case, as it was published in the future applications, and was credible intelligence, but it might have made it seem a little 
little less reputable as a source. Now this brings us to the next bullet point. Steele's post-termination relationship to the Department of Justice. Before and after he was terminated, Steele maintained contact with the Associate Deputy Attorney General Bruce Orr, who worked with Deputy Attorneys General Yates and later Rosenstein. Then again, maintained contact with is not really a smoking gun. I mean, I maintain contact with my middle school friends on Facebook, and believe me, we're not close anymore. Just the occasional, how are you, poke? Furthermore, there weren't any specifics given except for an out of context quote made before he was fired saying that Steele was desperate that Donald Trump not get elected and was passionate about him not being president. Yeah, okay, that definitely does not inspire confidence in your research. But buckle up your tinfoil hats everyone because we're about to enter conspiracy territory. Associate Deputy Attorney General Bruce Orr's wife worked for Fusion GPS, the company that worked with Steele to produce the dossier. And when the FBI submitted the request to monitor Carter Page, they didn't mention that Bruce Orr's wife worked with that company. Although, that seems like a kind of weird thing to add to the footnote. Hmm, his wife worked for that company that helped compile the dossier, therefore he had to show it to us? That said, strange coincidence, so who knows? This brings us to the fourth point in this memo. What's the deal with Steele? The FISA application that cited the Steele dossier relied on Steele's credibility with providing credible and accurate reporting on unrelated matters, while not mentioning its anti-Trump financial and ideological motivations. Also, during the time when his initial request to listen to Page's phone calls was submitted, Assistant Director Bill Preerstap said corroboration between the Steele dossier was in its infancy, although most of it has since been corroborated, at least the Page stuff. Come on, Carter, don't you know how to say I do not recall? Anyways, there's still the ethical question of whether using information that has only been in the infancy of corroboration to file a FISA application is acceptable, especially when Comey said it was salacious and unverified four months before the application was submitted. Although, the thing is 35 pages long and you had four months after that statement, so I'm sure you at least had some of it verified by the submission. Okay, so now the last point is the Papadopoulos problem. The Page FISA request also mentions information regarding Papadopoulos, but there were no clear connection between him and Page. And if you're wondering why you've heard the name Papadopoulos before... Jeff Pegues on the guilty plea by George Papadopoulos to charges he lied to the FBI about his contacts with Russian operatives. Now, to be fair, at the time of filing this first FISA filing, he was still probably in the lying to the FBI about his Russian contacts phase. So maybe the intel wasn't there. Also, another caveat is this still doesn't directly connect him to Carter Page, the man who the FISA request was for. So maybe he had separate and unrelated illegal contacts with the Russians. Although, that really doesn't inspire additional confidence. This Papadopoulos information was the impetus for the FBI investigation into Trump's Russia connection, alleges the memo. Okay, so here is, in my opinion, the most damaging part of the memo. I'm not sure why they put it last, though. In a competition to see who has the harder name to pronounce, FBI agent STRZOK, wow, okay, I'm just going to call him Stortozak and hope for the best. Anyways, that guy and his mistress, a detail that I'm sure he was glad to see ended up in this memo, another FBI agent, communicated via text about orchestrating leaks to the press and meeting with Deputy Director of the FBI, McCabe, to discuss an insurance policy in case Trump won the election. So that's the long and short of the memo. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I hope you enjoyed that last video. For more episodes of That's All I Have to Say About That, click here. Please click here to subscribe and remember to like below. And if you're really a fan, you can join our Facebook group. It's just a party over there.